Hi everyone. Um, in today's lecture, we will talk about genomes and genomics. We actually have talked a lot about genome in previous lectures. Genome is the set of DNA sequences that are carried by an individual. So then uh, the genomics is the study of the organization function and evolution of genomes. The human genome is a complete set of DNA sequences of humans. And we learned that we have more than 3 billion DNA base pairs in our genome. We also learned that we have DNA in both nucleus and the mitochondria. And they are also named as nuclear genome and uh, mitochondrial genome, respectively. So this slide shows the composition of human uh, nuclear genome. Usually, we just call the human genome. Okay, And you can see here, about 25% of the genome sequences are genes and their related sequences. And the, the other 75 are the uh, intergenic regions. Okay. A predominant part of intergenic regions consists of these uh, repetitive sequences. Actually, it counts for about 55% of the whole genome. And the STR we talked about in last lecture belongs to this category, all right? So in contrast, the uh, coding sequence, uh, and the coding sequences of more than uh, 20,000 human genes only compromise about 1% of the genome. And about the same genome share can, can be assigned to their regulatory sequences, making them uh, about 2% in total. Sometimes people call the non-gene coding sequences as junk sequences and useless. They think some people say it's useless. But my uh, personal opinion is that these sequences may be important, but their functions are yet to be identified. The Human Genome Project, also uh, called as HGP, so this is a international scientific research project with the goal of determining the base pairs that, that makes up the human DNA. And then um, identifying and mapping all the genes of human genome from both a physical and a functional standpoint. So the uh, HGP is set out to uh, sequence the human genome and the genomes of uh, also model organisms used in experimental genetics. And the scientists can use this information to identify and map all human genes and determine the functions of all the genes. So after the idea was picked up in uh, 1984 by the US government, when uh, the planning started, the project uh, formally uh, launched in 1990 and was declared completed um, on April the 14th, 2003. So this table shows the modern uh, organisms included in the Human Genome Project. So this include uh, the mouse, uh, he's showing here uh, Drosophila, which will also use it, and then Arabidopsis, um, and also the C. elegans yeast, uh, as well as uh, E. coli, this bacteria. Okay, now the sequence information of these organisms are all available for public, public use. I have shown you how to uh, get access to the human genome data like we, we, we know the version HG19 use a, a software called the IGV. So it's uh, this, this tool actually can directly link to the available uh, genetic informations. Um, this slide shows the history and timeline for a number of genomic projects. Um, even after 2003, you can see uh, when the human genome was uh, declared to be completed, Scientists uh, kept making more precise information about the uh, genomic sequences. So the later version of genomic sequencing is usually more accurate, okay? The Human Genome Project promotes other geno genome projects. Even after Human Genome Project was completed, 
this slide um, lists some major projects and you can find all this information online if you are interested in the details. Um, so you can Google search and uh, have this link, okay? I will not introduce them one by one in this class. All these genome projects create new scientific fields. For example, we need automated uh, DNA sequencing. The way of Sanger sequencing was too slow and impossible to carry out such a big volume of sequencing work. Also, we need new softwares and the develop algorithms to analyze the genome sequencing data. Um, these are what bi bioinformatic uh, scientists do. We usually call bioinformatic work as a dry lab work, which is in contrast uh, to the wet bench work in the lab. For example, you need to use buffer when running a gel electrophoresis, and that is wet, right? So if you enjoy like software coding, mass and like to work on computers, then a dry lab worker may be suitable for you, okay? Um, with sequencing work more and more popular in research, bioinformatics continues to have a big need at the uh, job market. This table shows the goals of genomics. The sequencing of the human genome holds benefits for many fields from uh, molecular medicine to human evolution. Again, I'm not going to go through this in details. We learned the Sanger sequencing, um, and I showed you a big uh, DNA sequencing gel, if you remember. So this is another DNA sequencing gel showing the separation of fragments in the four sequencing reactions, okay? So the sequence actually is read from the bottom, uh, starting the lowest uh, uh, band in any lane, and then go up uh, to the top. So in this gel, the sequencing begins with actually C A T C G, right? So sequencing began with A. So the sequence is A A T C G G, okay? and then C, C, G, uh, C, T, something like that, okay? So this sounds, you, you can tell it's extremely slow, right? So for 3 billion nucleotides, apparently we need the computers to do uh, the work, right? So this picture shows gene sequencing computers used in human genome research at uh, a company called the Celera Corporation in Maryland in the early days when the Human Genome Project was just started. So this is a supercomputer. Um, but then the sequence uh, strategies included several steps. So first, the, the genomic DNA of donors was isolated and then cut into manageable size fragments by restriction enzymes. We know the restriction enzymes look like uh, scissors, they cut, right? And then these DNA fragments will be sequences, sequenced individually, okay? Once all the sequencing data were obtained, software was used to assemble those sequences. Sequencing each fragment is straightforward, but correctly assemble the sequence from thousands or millions of fragments is a difficult task. To manage this process, two sequencing strategies were used, okay? The first one is called a uh, map-based sequencing, also known uh, as clone-by-clone clone method. And the second is uh, called a whole genome sequencing, also uh, known as uh, shotgun methods, okay? So both methods have been used in the Human Genome Project. Let's see how these methods work. So this slide shows the map-based or clone-by-clone clone method of genome sequencing. So first, the genetic, genetic map and physical maps are constructed for each chromosome. Um, clones from each chromosome library are organized into overlapping sets and each clone is sequenced, all right? So the genome sequence is assembled as the clones are sequenced using the markers from the genetic 
and the physical maps as guides. The advantage of this method is that every fragment of DNA is taken from a known region of the genome. So it is relatively easy to determine where there are any gaps in the sequence. And as each fragment is distinct, many people can work on the genome simultaneously. However, um, there, were, there were also these advantages. Making clones and generating genome maps takes a long time. And some parts of the chromosome, such as uh, centromeres containing long repetitive sequences, which make them difficult to cut and clone. So um, in the whole genome method or shotgun method, Geno genomic libraries are prepared using several restriction enzymes, okay? And clones are chosen randomly for sequencing. They just cut and sequence. Software programs assemble the sequences, looking for stretches of sequence from different reads that are identical with one another, okay? When identical regions are identified, they were overlapped with one another allowing the two sequences to be sticked together. So the, this computer process is repeated over and over and over again, eventually yield a complete sequence of the starting piece of DNA. So the uh, Human Genome Project sponsored by the National Institute of Health and the Department of Energy um, started its work using the map-based method and the Celera Corporation's project used the whole genome or the shotgun method. So the company used the, the shotgun method, but the government used uh, the, the uh, other uh, method. So the process of identifying the boundaries between genes and other features in a raw DNA sequence is called a genome annotation, okay? And is in the domain, it belongs to the domain of bioinformatics. For example, this slide shows a stretch of DNA sequences um, generated in a sequencing project. Analysis using gene searching software shows uh, several um, open reading frames, also called the ORF, starting from here maybe, and then the other. Uh, and the axons are shown in blue, shown in blue, these are axons, bordered by the splice, uh, splicing junctions between introns and axons. A sequence just before the coding region marks the site at which transcription begins. That's where the transcription begins, shown in the green color. Database searches show that this sequence encodes a human beta globin gene. So this protein is part of the hemoglobin, the oxygen carrying protein found uh, in red blood cells. So the slides, uh, the uh, taking home message is that uh, you need to understand that with this uh, different uh, uh, sequences, there are softwares that can go through the sequence and identify where the transcription start and where the intron and actual may start. So the, this slide shows the cost of genome sequence. Uh, in early 2000, okay, showing here, is a complete sequencing of a human genome. How much is it? It cost $100 million, while the cost dropped significantly uh, starting from uh, 2007 uh, when uh, next generation sequencing become available, okay? Now the cost, uh, 2009, 2020, it's about one cylinder per sample. So that much, much uh, less. Next generation sequencing has revolutionized the biological uh, sciences. It's an ultra high throughput automatic uh, sequencing. So that's why the next generation uh, is called, also sometimes called NGS. So here we show um, a NGS machine. This is one, this is another one, okay. So the sequencing of the first human genome took about 13 years to complete. We know that. But today, it only needs about one day, okay. Now let's take a look 
uh, how genome sequencing is done uh, in a video. This here shows your uh, actual next generation sequencing. Uh, You've probably heard of the human genome, the huge collection of genes inside each and every one of your cells. You probably also know that we've sequenced the human genome. But what does that actually mean? How do you sequence someone's genome? Let's back up a bit. What is a genome? Well, a genome is all the genes, plus some extra, that make up an organism. Genes are made up of DNA, and DNA is made up of long paired strands of A's, T's, C's, and G's. Your genome is the code that your cells use to know how to behave. Cells interacting together make tissues. Tissues cooperating with each other make organs. Organs cooperating with each other make an organism. You. So, you are who you are in large part because of your genome. The first human genome was sequenced 10 years ago and was no easy task. It took two decades to complete, required the effort of hundreds of scientists across dozens of countries, and cost over $3 billion. But someday, very soon, it will be possible to know the sequence of letters that make up your own personal genome all in a matter of minutes, and for less than the cost of a pretty nice birthday present. How is that possible? Let's take a closer look. Knowing the sequence of the billions of letters that make up your genome is the goal of genome sequencing. A genome is both really, really big and very, very small. The individual letters of DNA, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, are only eight or 10 atoms wide, and they're all packed together into a clump, like a ball of yarn. So, to get all that information out of that tiny space, scientists first have to break the long string of DNA down into smaller pieces. Each of these pieces is then separated in space and sequenced individually. But how? It's helpful to remember that DNA binds to other DNA if the sequences are the exact opposite of each other. A's bind to T's, and T's bind to A's. G's bind to C's, and C's to G's. If the A, T, G, C sequence of two pieces of DNA are exact opposites, they stick together. Because the genome pieces are so very small, we need some way to increase the signal we can detect from each of the individual letters. In the most common method, scientists use enzymes to make thousands of copies of each genome piece. So we now have thousands of replicas of each of the genome pieces, all with the same sequence of A's, T's, G's, and C's. But we have to read them all somehow. To do this, we need to make a batch of special letters, each with a distinct color. A mixture of these special colored letters and enzymes are then added to the genome we're trying to read. At each spot on the genome, one of the special letters binds to its opposite letter. So we now have a double-stranded piece of DNA with a colorful spot at each letter. Scientists then take pictures of each snippet of genome. Seeing the order of the colors allows us to read the sequence. The sequences of each of these millions of pieces of DNA are stitched together using computer programs to create a complete sequence of the entire genome. This isn't the only way to read the letter sequences of pieces of DNA, but it's one of the most common. Of course, just reading the letters in the genome doesn't tell us much. It's kind of like looking through a book written in a language you don't speak. You can recognize all the letters, but still have no idea what's going on. So the next step is to decipher what the sequence means, how your genome and my genome are different. Interpreting the genes of the genome is the part scientists are still working on. While not every difference is consequential, the sum of these differences is responsible for differences in how we look, what we like, how we act, and even how likely we are to get sick or respond to specific medicines. Better understanding of how disparities between our genomes account for these differences is sure to change the way we think, not only about how doctors treat their patients, but also how we treat each other.
Now from the human genome project, what did we learn? We learned that about 2% of human genome contains protein coding sequences and about 1.1% is uh, composed of axons. We learned that gene rich region on chromosomes are separated by gene poor regions, meaning genes are dispersed in the genome. Okay, we also learned that uh, we have only 20,000 genes that encode the protein, which is even less than gene numbers found in mouse. Although human does not have the most gene numbers from previous lectures, we learned that human proteins can be diversified by alternative splicing and the various proto-translational modifications. Still remember that? We also share many genes with other species, like about 50% similarity to Drosophila and more than 98% similarity to chimpanzees. Here is a table with a comparison of selected genomes. You can see that a mouse genome shares about 90% genes with human making mouse a perfect genetic model for studying uh, human diseases. The sequence of the DNA is stored in databases available to anyone uh, on the internet. So the US uh, National Center for uh, Biotechnology Information, um, it's called uh, uh, abbreviated as NCBI. Okay, so if you Google it, you will find the NCBI what they are. Okay, so and then also sister organization in Europe and Japan, they house the gene sequences in a database known as a gene bank, okay, um, along with the sequences of known and hypothetical genes and the proteins, all these are available to anybody who have access to internet. So here shows all these uh, different uh, uh, internet uh, websites that you can look into. Now let's get back to the basic structure of genes. Remember that we learned um, a complete gene contains both axons and introns, right? And intron sequences are spliced out um, during the uh, uh, splicing event. When you're making the mature mRNA, it will splice out, right? Showing here the axon is the yellowish and the intron is the gray and then in the matured mRNA sequence, you only see these in, uh, axons, but no introns, right? Um, but then um, when we study the protein function or amino acid mutations identified in human disease, um, the sequence information of intron uh, is a lot of times, most of the times are not quite re relevant. Is that, is that correct? So there are, Scientists that they develop a way to sequence the axons only, but not the intron, because uh, most the mutations are still relevant uh, to the uh, sequence in the axon. Okay, so we name this method as axon sequencing. So um, since axon, that also means the part of the genome only consists of uh, axons. Uh, it's about uh, 1% in our genome. So it is much faster and cheaper to have a exome sequencing. So exome sequencing targets only the protein, and let's just using this uh, uh, apple as an example. They only target the protein coding regions for the human genome. So which contains approximately 85% of disease causing variants, okay, covers 85% already. So these days, one exome sequencing can cost as low as $300 per sample, and the sequence running time is about 20 minutes. So it's really fast and efficient. Um, with further development of sequencing technology, scientists have able, uh, are able to use less and less cells for sequencing. Uh, I would like to introduce you the single cell sequencing strategy. So which is also named as uh, SCS, 
single cell sequencing, okay? So this sequencing uh, technology will examine the sequence information from individual cells with optimized the next generation sequence technologies, providing a higher resolution of cellular difference, the difference between cell to cell, okay? The single cell sequencing has proved to be a powerful tool to study cell heterogeneity through analysis of a whole genome and transcriptome of a uh, in individual cell. So the transcriptome is actually the set of uh, or only uh, transcripts, including coding and non-coding in an individual or population of cells. For example, in cancer, okay, Sequencing the DNA of individual cells can give information about mutations carried by a small population of cells. Okay. In development, sequencing the RNA expressed by individual cells can give insight to the uh, existence and behavior of different cell types. So the single cell sequencing allows analysis of genome and the transcriptome of individual cells depending which uh, materials you start with, right? Uh, for example, for analysis of genome here, um, like genomic DNA is used. For transcriptome analysis, then RNA is used. Technically, a uh, single cell sequence can be divided in three major steps. Um, the first step is uh, isolate the, the single cell and uh, capture when cells are physically isolated uh, individually, okay? So showing here, you have to isolate single cells, no matter you get a DNA or RNA, it's the same thing. Secondly, you will need to um, have the uh, nucleic acid uh, amplification and the library preparation, all right? So in this step, genomic DNA is then amplified uh, while RNA, then you require so what? Reverse transcription to make cDNA, which is a complementary uh, DNA prior to the amplification by the PCR. We learned that, right? So um, then amplified DNA is used to prepare libraries for sequencing. So each of them will generate a DNA library, the same thing, and then for further sequencing and analysis. Okay, so here basically the transcriptome is reflected by the seeding library constructed at, at this top. Okay, so then finally you would uh, do this analysis uh, using bioinformatics way. Once we obtain the genome sequence data, we can answer uh, any question related to genetic disorder. Um, we will know where the disease causing gene is located and may find out the function of the protein and how the mutated sequence can contribute to the disease. Okay, next I'll give you an example. Free Rix uh, ataxia is a rare autosomal recessive genetic disease that causes difficulty working a loss of sensation in the arms and legs and impair the speech. It is also known as uh, spinal cerebellar degeneration. This disease causes damage to parts of brain and spinal cord and can also affect the, the patient's heart. It occurs with a frequency of uh, uh, one out of 50,000 births. Positional cloning map, the FRDA gene, um, and in uh, free riches ataxia patients, expanded trinucleotide repeats were found in the intron of this gene. Okay, up to 500 uh, repeats of this GAA uh, disrupted expression of this gene, namely uh, the frataxin protein. Okay, on the right here shows the, a three-dimensional model uh, of this molecular structure of the fractaxin protein. A decreased production of function of this protein causes uh, the Frederick ataxia. However, 
the frataxin protein sequence yield no matches in any protein database from the human being. So what was going on? Well, why is that? The researchers then decided to rescan protein databases using only partial sequence of uh, frataxin protein. Interestingly, they found a similar protein existing in several species of purple bacteria, which is the closest living relatives to uh, ancient bacteria species that evolved from mitochondria. Okay, so indeed, the later scientists confirmed that uh, frataxin is a mitochondrial protein and its deficiency caused the mitochondrial dysfunction and finally led to cell failure. This disorder is one of the first whose molecular basis was uncovered by using analysis of gene uh, genomic information. Since we talked about proteins, I would like to introduce the pro proteomics. Proteomics is an extension of genomics. Okay. Proteome is the collection of proteins present in a cell at a given time under specific conditions. Okay. From this definition, you can tell that the protein composition in a cell is dynamic and is subjected to changes under different conditions. This is in contrast to genome, which consists of uh, genomic meaning and the genetic information is constant and not subject to change. Okay, proteomics is the study of proteome. Similar to study genome to identify genetic mutations, scientists can apply proteomics to see how proteins change under disease conditions. For example, in one particular protein, uh, if, just say if, one particular protein consistently become high in certain disease, we will measure the protein level to diagnose the disease, meaning this protein can be used as a biomarker, okay? Uh, give you an example. So there's a protein called a PSA, uh, this is a protein elevated in almost all prostate cancer patients. Sometimes can be hundreds folds of higher than normal people. Okay? We can use uh, PSA as a diagnosis marker in this case. Right? So um, if one protein is an important molecule for certain disease, um, then like another thing is androgen receptor, for example is a driver for prostate cancer development, we learned that. Then scientists can design draw to target those important molecules and treat the disease, right? So indeed the anti-androgens have been routinely used in clinics to treat the prostate cancers. So all these are the, um, the purpose of uh, or uses of uh, proteomics. There are many ways to char characterize the proteome. Um, here shows a very traditional way, uh, which is called a two-dimensional gel or 2D gel, okay? The proteins uh, expressed in one cell can separate them uh, by size, not, not one cell, but just in cells. Uh, they can be separated by size and uh, electric charge, and then they can displace on a gel. Usually this is a, um, this 2D gel is a two-step uh, process. For example, showing here, you can run uh, or separate the proteins by size from top to bottom, you separate them. And then um, you, the, the proteins can further separate it by the electric charge, uh, maybe from left to right. So you will, later will have a, a picture showing like that. The spots on this gel represent the protein in a uh, gene expression file. For instance, labeled that this is a HSP60, uh, the HESHA protein 60. Okay, when you compare two samples, you will need to compare all these different spots, uh, one sample and another sample. So um, 
if there's a difference between those two gels, you will be able to identify which protein actually uh, they express differently between the two different samples. Um, the 2D gels were popular about 20 years ago, but now very few people are using this uh, a method uh, anymore. Okay, I would like to introduce an excellent example of using proteomics as a tool for diagnosis of disease, okay. Um, so this is Dr. Uh, Chen Jia Mohan. So he is a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering uh, in our school. So he's famous of uh, studying, uh, studying the autoimmune diseases. One of his projects is to identify novel biomarkers using uh, proteomics, okay. This slide shows an array that he developed. So on this array, he printed um, 1,000 uh, antibodies and each of these antibodies can bind to one specific human serum proteins, okay. So each spot shown here actually can determine the level of one kind of serum protein. Um, Dr. Mohan compared the serum samples collected from the healthy individuals and the lupus patient. Uh, showing here, you can see that in the lupus samples, many spots uh, are lighted up. For example, these are the spots showing lighted up, but here is not that much, right? So indicating these proteins are upregulated in lupus patient, showing some others, some here as well. But the, the country, these proteins, for example, showing this six and this six that are not, mu not much changed, right? So in this case, um, this upregulated protein or downregulated protein, they can serve as normal biomarkers for lupus diagnosis. Uh, he actually already identified the 40 normal biomarkers by uh, performing those uh, uh, array. Lastly, I would like to introduce a genome editing tool. So I bet everybody has heard of it. So that's the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, okay? This year's Nobel Prize in chemistry uh, has been awarded to two women scientists who transformed uh, CRISPR and CRISPR is a, actually an obscure bacterial immune mechanism. They transferred into a tool that can simply and you know, cheaply editing the uh, genomes of, of everything from wheat to mosquitoes and then even to human beings, okay? Um, then CRISPR-Cas9 is a short uh, for the cluster regularly interspaced uh, short uh, uh, palindromic uh, repeats and the CRISPR associated protein 9. So very complicated name, okay. It is an efficient tool to modify genome and has been widely used in research labs. Uh, we have CRISPR-Cas9 doing in my lab as well. We use that almost every single day. Okay, the following video will provide a uh, great information on this technology. And uh, after this uh, video, our, this lecture will end. Okay, uh, see you next time. Thank you. See the video. The CRISPR-Cas9 system is a tool for cutting DNA at a specifically targeted location. The technique has already revolutionized gene editing, but scientists are always looking for new possibilities. So what else can CRISPR do? Since being discovered in a bacterial immune system, CRISPR-Cas9 has been adapted into a powerful tool for genomic research. There are two components to the system, a DNA cutting protein called Cas9 and an RNA molecule known as the guide RNA. Bound together, they form a complex that can identify and cut specific sections of DNA. First, Cas9 has to locate and bind to a common sequence in the genome called a PAM. Once the PAM is bound, the guide RNA unwinds part of the double helix. The RNA strand is designed to match and bind a particular sequence in the DNA. 
Once it's found the correct sequence, Cas9 can cut the DNA. Its two nuclease domains each make a nick, leading to a double-strand break. Although the cell will try to repair this break, the fixing process is error-prone and often inadvertently introduces mutations that disable the gene. This makes CRISPR a great tool for knocking out specific genes. But making double-strand breaks isn't all CRISPR can do. Some researchers are deactivating one or both of Cas9's cutting domains and fusing new enzymes onto the protein. Cas9 can then be used to transport those enzymes to a specific DNA sequence. In one example, Cas9 is fused to an enzyme, a deaminase, which mutates specific DNA bases, eventually replacing cytidine with thymidine. This kind of precise gene editing means you could turn a disease-causing mutation into a healthy version of the gene, or introduce a stop codon at a specific place. But it's not all about gene editing. Several labs have been working on ways to use CRISPR to promote gene transcription. They do this by deactivating Cas9 completely, so it can no longer cut DNA. Instead, transcriptional activators are added to the Cas9 by either fusing them directly or via a string of peptides. Alternatively, the activators can be recruited to the guide RNA instead. These activators recruit the cell's transcription machinery, bringing RNA polymerase and other factors to the target and increasing transcription of that gene. The same principle applies to gene silencing. A crab domain fused to the Cas9 inactivates transcription by recruiting more factors that physically block the gene. A more outside-the-box idea for using CRISPR is to attach fluorescent proteins to the complex so you can see where particular DNA sequences are found in the cell. This could be useful for things like visualising the 3D architecture of the genome, or to paint an entire chromosome and follow its position in the nucleus. CRISPR has already changed the face of research, but these new ideas show that what's been achieved so far could just be the tip of the iceberg when it comes to CRISPR's potential. Whatever comes next, it seems the CRISPR revolution is far from over.